up, KD? Big Mike Jones. <laughs> well, welcome everybody to episode 31 of Drinks and Dogs. Can you believe we've done 31 of these things? Dude. Well, I mean, it's probably because I can't remember at least like 25% of them. <laughs> I, I would agree. I might, mine would be about 30. <laughs> it, you know, it is drinks and dogs, but I'm I'm sticking with just like caffeine. Well, so here we go. Uh, I have a I'll have to cheers to you. So this is caffeine, but there's also something else in it. Cheers. <laughs> cheers, buddy. That actually looks good. What is it? It's Monster and Tito's. Oh. Yeah, I was freaking, I was like, whatever. I was like, you know, last time we did Propel or stuff like that, I was like, dude, I was like, let me just freaking, I'll just drink a little bit on this one. It's my, it's my full day off, so, which is not really something that's common over here. Well, we talked about in the last episode about days off. We talked about, you know, being off and what that entails and doesn't entail. I will say something I notice right now. You're you're not, you're not in a sling. Yeah, so I I've been think. taking. Yeah, I've been taking a bunch of different like nerve medication, and then there's a whole. My daughter's a horse trainer. She's really big into homeopathic homeopathic therapy, so she gave me a bunch of. I don't even know if this is something I should say on here, but she gave me a bunch of stuff stuff that, stuff that helps with uh, rejuvenating muscle tissue and like nerve like nerve damage, and you just have to be consistent with it. So shout out to Brandy at the Acres, um, and she gave that to me, and then I started like using it and. I went to the doctors. The doctors are like, okay, like your shoulders look like your shoulders pretty banged up. But then like I started using that stuff and I started to feel better. Like the other day, I kind of have like this like like mental nervous breakdown because I couldn't do anything physical. And like physical stuff is like I have to move. Like I have to like do things. So I just said, fuck it. And I just started running on the treadmill, did like seven miles, and then I worked Felix on my right leg because my left leg's gone. And I kept taking her stuff. And it just like I, my body started just to feel better like every day. And like I was just like, okay, cool. I was like, well, shit. Like, it's pretty. Like, it's pretty awesome. Like, using all the the regular su supplements I take, like Tonkat Ali, Kelp, the beet stuff, um, uh, like milk thistle. Like, there's a variety of. I take a shit ton of supplements, uh, some green stuff, and then I started utilizing the stuff that she was taking me and actually being consistent with it. Because for a minute I wasn't consistent with it. And I started being consistent with all that stuff, and the next thing you know, it's like, okay, cool. Like, I can walk around and not feel my shoulder pop out not feel like or any pain in my shoulder or pain in my knee and next thing you know i'm like you know now i'm no sling you know so i'm I'm gradually going to get back into working out and utilizing working some dogs and i have an appointment with the or orthopedic surgeon on the seventh and my i'm really hoping that they just go like oh hey like you're completely you know healed or fine or whatever it may be so it's been working dude you gotta get with my guy chris absolutely the, the mace guy okay nice shout out to chris uh oh my god i can't pronounce his last name trinity uh <laughs> trinity alignment uh we'll we'll put a we'll throw something in the uh in the youtube card yeah, it'll, for it'll, it'll be in the um, edit <laughs> yeah you know he's he's like i cannot say enough amazingly good endorsement things for that guy like my shoulders have never felt this good never that's awesome. And it's, I mean, they're stronger than they've ever been. And I haven't been lifting weights. There's zero pain when I have lifted weights a couple of times, you know, just here and there. Um, zero pain when doing things that typically caused pain. Like, dude, the nice. mace fell and, and like all oh, the swing in that thing. Dude, now I know why the wrestlers of, you know, the catch wrestlers in the the over in India, why they do that stuff? It's that exercise is amazing. Oh, I mean, I'd, I'd love to do that stuff because anything to help my shoulders, so I can get back to like working dogs and shooting my bow or my bows and stuff like that. Like that'll be freaking that'll be, that'll be a great day. <laughs> I got it. Okay, so I got another question for you. I'm, I'm running through the lines because I really haven't talked to you since last episode. Um, tell me about bite night. And Santa Cruz at the Catalyst. I mean, we talked about it in the last episode. Let's like give give. The, How'd it go, man? So it was like for me, like I'm sure you already know this about me. Like I, I like I'm not an, an extremely social person. Like I'm not I'm not a really social person in general. <laughs> Understand? Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I was just choked. 
Every, like, you know, like people see me online and they're like, oh, you must be like very social and stuff like that. I was like, I am like not social whatsoever. Like I have to put on, we, we, we call it the show, you know, like I'd like, I'd kind of do it that way. So in that day in particular, I was in a lot of pain. So I was like, we get there. And I was just like, I told my fiance, I was like, man, I was like, just give me a couple drinks. I was like, I need to fucking like, I need to prepare for this. Like, that's just kind of how like I'll like be able to focus back in onto certain things because like pain medication doesn't work for me. So like, you know, we're a couple drinks in, actually a few drinks in, and then we start uh, Chris Sykes's uh, cert. So like, you know, he's struggling, and like I was like at that point, like I already, I already had like a pretty decent buzz on me, and like you know, the the Mike Jones mode kind of clicks in. And then I just started doing like one handed push ups, like popping my shoulder, like, you know, doing like, like one handed burpee, like, you know, stuff like that, like just dumb stuff I shouldn't have done. But I was just like, I was trying to help motivate him in the sense, you know, to be like, oh, if I'm doing this, this thing, you can do this too, like type of a thing. And then that ended up like really injuring me. So then I was like, screw it. So I sat down next to Rich and like we had like a couple drinks the next, you know, like I'm, I'm coaching, I'm helping everybody out. And I was like, dude, it was like, my shit is messed up. And then at the end, I don't know if you saw, I posted it on my story. Like, uh, I was talking to my buddy Rory. I was like, dude, I just want to send Zilla, you know, kind of like say bye to my dog bear. So like, you know, I was just like, I got a little bit emotional at the end, but a lot of it could have been just some of the other stuff too. So it was, I ended, I ended up having to leave early because like my shit was like all the way out. I had to have Jock, uh, like put my shoulder back in and then freaking why, like I was like, got all upset. So I was like, so I just took off, but I mean, it was, it was a crazy event, man. Like those, those type of things, like for me, just because like, you know, like I like I came I came from like absolutely nothing in my life. So like it was like when I have like when we go to the catalyst and like we do something like like that in a in a city like Santa Cruz, which is nothing against Santa Cruz, but like you know, it, they're like kind of hippie ish. And like, you know, it's a, we were we were scared. Like I was scared because I was like, man, I don't want to end up on the you know, the effing news for like some bite night stuff, considering like, you know, it was it was pretty like it was like all eyes on the decoys. So it was a, one of those events where I was like, oh man, it was, it was crazy. But like, I was, it was, it was, uh, it was an event. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was an event. It was pretty cool though. I mean, I, I had my buddy Maxwell who runs the the spot, shout out to Kyle Maxwell. Uh, but he runs the spot and like, he, they're telling me like, they were all pretty pumped about it. And like the energy was good and everybody like, it was cool to see like decoys get like, like people up on the balcony. And like decoys come up and like they send the dog and then you know the freaking people are like screaming for them and like it was just like you know it was like a sporting event in, in its own self. So I mean, we are talking about a canine street league esque deal. I mean, that's what we're all about, man. This these aren't it's not just dog sports. It's events. It's creating a culture of enthusiasm. It's creating a culture of welcome welcoming people whether they know what's going on or not, yeah. and getting them to experience something in a context that is welcoming and warm and fun and enjoying what these dogs can do learning and enjoying what these talented trainers and decoys can do so i mean yeah it is an event yeah i mean that's I, I think like one of the reels that they posted i was like looked at g i was like dude i was like i was like well or i guess we're breaking all the rules now so you know it's just one of those like levels where i'm like oh hey like this is something that we can achieve because when I when I had started to think about the catalyst, and I was doing I was doing it like I, that's when I created the tour and did all this stuff like that because I was going I couldn't work out I couldn't do anything like that I was dealing with the bear stuff dealing with some life stuff and I was like shoot let me just throw this out there, like not thinking it was gonna stick, like just just trying to be like oh hey let's go ahead and do it and then when they're like hey we're we're down, I was like oh shit, so yeah. <laughs> You that, but yeah, this has, that's man that's how stuff happens right yeah you can't be overly cautious we know this in business we know this in life you know it success rewards the risk taker if there wasn't any risk everyone would do it and you got to pull the trigger not sometimes but you got to pull the trigger a lot even when you don't feel like it and sometimes you just got to say and do it and you did it and then all of a sudden you're like oh wait a minute that was kind of hip oh wait a minute well people were clapping well wait a minute people liked it it's like yeah dude like you gotta put it out there you gotta let it you gotta let them hang out you know no one's gonna touch it if you don't put it out there <laughs> yeah that was the that was the, one of the things where i sat down i was like sitting with rich and i looked over at him i was like looking up at like all the people and like everything like that and i was like dude I was like can you like can you effing believe this like this doesn't even seem like a like a reality type of a thing like this is like weird but I mean, you know, going on that too, like we talk about risk takers, we talk about, uh, you know, 
the work and things like that. So this is like maybe a little bit off subject with it, but like compatibility with people who are different. And like, there's a lot of, like, I got a call from like someone of my, one of my friends and they're like, you know, you're doing this and doing that, stuff like that. Like, and I was like, so yeah, I was always doing those things, but like, this is like kind of like my personality, right? Like this is, I'm a risk taker. I do these things. I, I live a little bit more in the extreme than the average person. So like, that's where like, I think like there's mis- kind of some misunderstanding and again, like this might be a little bit off subject, but the compatibility with people, with people understanding, you know, what a risk taker is like and what like their life is like the comp- their comparison of like, oh, like people want people to be like kind of more calm if they're calm. Whereas people who are, you know, similar to people like us who are kind of going forward and like kind of just doing all these things, you know, the misunderstanding of personalities and understanding that. And I think that it's in like something with uh, entrepreneurs as well. You know, sometimes entrepreneurs can be completely misunderstood, even though in their mind they're doing something positive and the their behaviors may be fluctuating between, you know, going something crazy or like, you know, someone who wants to kind of calm down and that person, other person wants to turn it up. Man, like we could go, we could go so deep on that. <laughs> in, That's I what mean, she said. Ah, <laughs> well played. Oh, um, I'll have what he's having, please. Yeah, bartender. bartender. Um, yeah, man. Like it, it is mindset, and to an extent, there is inherent temperament and personality, and then to another extent, it's what we can learn and how we can change ourselves. And that's something that I personally learned a lot about in the context of entrepreneurship. You know, it it was in taking a business that was nothing (laughs) and taking it to six figure net and going through that process. Like, holy cow crap you talk about fear you talk about having to deal with things that make you incredibly uncomfortable and then you know quitting the secure job that provided the comfort to play with the other jobs and saying all right let's do this you know for me it was work for me it wasn't natural um i'm very much my own personality combined to a large degree with how i was raised is risk is bad. Avoid risk. You know, I've suffered from paralysis of analysis my whole life. Um, right down to, you know, dude, like this is played into like why I got into jujitsu, why I ended up buying a dirt bike. Like all these little life things I've done as an adult were me trying to stick my middle finger up at who I was raised to be who I was as a child. You know, I was, you know, they say kids don't have fear. Well, I was that kid who at five years old still had like had fear. Like I would, all the other kids would jump over this and I'd stand there and go, yeah, but you know, if you did that and you missed, you'd break your leg. Like dude, five and six years old, I was thinking that way. Yeah. Meanwhile, the other kids are doing, all, you know, doing what kids do. Yeah. I was like, oh no, no. And then I get older and I was, you know, I had ingrained in me quite heavily, you know, risk versus reward, analyze everything. And if, if the, you know, if the reward of success doesn't outweigh the risk of failure, go, you know, don't do it. So that made me very inhibited to make a lot of decisions. It made me often seek comfort and in, in security. Then you turn 40 years old and you're not where you want to be. And you're like, what the heck's going on? Well, for me, it was, you know, my mid thirties, I started going, whoa, I'm not living the life I want to live. Why am I? Oh, because Europe, Europe, fix that, you know? And so I started surrounding myself by, with absolute crushers, you know, and then I got into entrepreneurship much heavier and started, you know, studying under people and paying lots of money for consultants and masterminds. And I'm looking at these individuals who are incredibly successful I'm like, oh, yeah, you, you're one percenters. You're outliers. And that's where I can see how, how you were saying, like, some people look and they're like, oh. yeah, because it's in either intimidating or it, it makes them f- feel kind of funky to be around someone who's go, 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 someone who is aggressive in their choices, someone who is confident and someone who does throw some uh, a certain element of caution to the wind and say, well, you're not going to get the good stuff if you don't go through some discomfort. You're not going to get the good stuff if you don't let it hang out. Are you going to fail along the way? Absolutely. Yep. And then you pick yourself back up and you keep going. 
Exactly. That's like, I think that's one of the, one of the things you brought up too. It's like how you're raised kind of, I think people always talk about like, you know, like, you know, how you're raised and everything like that, how it affects your childhood. And some people think it's like, okay, like, you know, you have your own choices and everything like that. But I think later in life, you figure out like partially how you were raised does affect what, who you become, you know, and like everything that does from that. Like for me, like I've figured out in my late, I'm even recently, I know, yeah, I'm 38. So in the last like year, I've really figured out like, okay, like the reason why I act the way I act, the way I have the sense of urgency is because I was raised like, you know, very poor, you know, like not money, not much support, you know, a lot of conflict in the house, all those things. So my, like you said, like there's like, you know, people who want to take that risk. Like for me, like all I know is like, okay, like get up panic attack. Cause I got to go, even though like I live a really good life, you know, panic attack, how am I going to do this? And then start creating and start working and doing those other things. Like, and it's just go, 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 go because of what I'm used to, you know, because back when I was young, it's like, how am I going to eat? You know, like, that's like, how are we, how are we going to do this? And that's what I was thinking that like you said, like at five years old, similar to me, like that five years old, I was, I was more than, I was more than I was on the street, you know, I was like doing, I was doing hood rat shit with my friends. <laughs> trying to bring I was a meal thinking in. that same thing when you said that i was, I was doing hood rat things with hood rat friends Ooh, but i think that's it's, it's interesting and that's something i've been really diving back into uh in this last or diving into in this last like year or so the thought process of it you can't grow if you can't see and the thing you need to see is yourself and i i work on this a lot in the canine blueprint believe it or not you know, and those you know those who are familiar with what I do and how I work with dog owners, um, in particular my students, like they know it's so much less about how to hold the leash, and we have conversations that have nothing to do with dogs, because yeah. you can't become a better dog trainer if you don't become a better person. You can't be a better dog owner if you don't become a better, stronger person, and we do a lot of looking in the mirror. And there is a deciding factor that's going to determine, you know, your ability to progress, your ability to achieve any type of success right off the bat. And it's your willingness to look in the mirror. There are many people who are completely presently, I use the word presently to remain optimistic, presently unable to look in the mirror. They cannot own their faults. It makes them uncomfortable. Um, I know a lot of people like that. I know less and less now in my circle because honestly, I... I, as I have been obsessed with my own journey, I have a difficult time relating to and associating with people who don't share that same willingness, that same hunger, or even that same ability to look in the mirror because like, I'm just, I can't relate to that. I've always been very introspective to the point where it's been a problem. So I over, you know, we talked about that. I overanalyze things. Well, one thing I've never had a problem doing was analyzing myself. Yep. And because I had that ability, it's allowed me to seek out mentorship. It's allowed me to seek out growth. It's allowed me to do things intelligently and strategically to try to change things I don't like about myself that I can improve on. Well, when you're a dog owner, like you have to be able to do that. Like you have to be able to change yourself to change the dog. If you're a dog trainer and you're struggling in your business, well, there's reasons why you're struggling. If you're not able to have to look in the mirror, because realize if you're a dog trainer and you're struggling in your business, you're struggling in your life. Like the only way that changes is if you make changes. Well, that means you have to be willing to accept that you have to make changes and chances are good. Those changes have to do with yourself. And if you're not able to hear that, if you're not able to look at it even silently, well, you won't be making any changes. Nope. <laughs> and if they, I love the saying, if nothing changes, then nothing changes. Yep. I just mean, I 100%. I mean, like, that's something too. Like, when I've seen this earlier in a, the career, especially with some of like some new dog trainers too, like, it's always become, it's, it's always someone else's fault why the dog is not acting the same way, well, acting the way, right? It's always someone else's fault. It's always their, you know, it's the handler, it's this, whatever, like that. It's like, no, it's like you're, you're not communicating in a way that they understand. And a lot of the, a lot of the reasons why you're not communicating, communicating in a way they understand and relating to them is because you're stuck in your own head, like you're right consistently when you should be able to adapt, understand what you need to do in life changes in order to help the dog in front of you. 
and help the hand and more like you said it's more so help the handler in front of you i mean dude that goes right into what we do every day and what we see every day in the context of you know people that struggle with their dogs and you know i'm very active on social media you know the bulk of my business is with people that are thousands of miles away from me so i see a lot of toxic stuff and if anybody follows me on facebook you know facebook is where i usually air all that laundry <laughs> did you see my post yesterday no let me put you, where's my phone i don't even know where my phone's at I have to look it up. What'd you do? <laughs> just uh, just the face. I know you did something. <laughs> I, the question, what'd you do, KD? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people know, I'm very fond of pit bulls. Yep. Just, I keep going back to it. You know, when it comes to dogs, like they have my heart right now, man. Like I just love pit bulls and their kin. We'll refer to it that way, you know, because it goes beyond the purebred American pit bull terrier. I, I enjoy a lot of those type of dogs. <laughs> Have for years. Also got a lot of experience for them. And forgive me, I got a cold. I've been traveling a lot. So I'm like <laughs> sniffling. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I, I go into these pit bull groups. Uh, <sighs> like we all got to take a deep breath, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a little more coffee. A little bit, a little bit more. Um, now I need some bourbon. Um, I think this one was called the Pity Group. Like that's the name of it, Pity. Uh, so you already know. You yeah. already know. And so what I did on Facebook is I'll do this every once in a while. Is I'll just share a little interaction that I had. I didn't use screenshots this time, but I'll, I'll share a conversation. So this lady. Posts in the group asking for help, asking for advice. All right, you know, maybe some dog behavior here. Maybe I can help somebody. Goes on to talk about her wonderful, I think it was eight month old male pit bull. I saw a picture. Looked looked like a pit bull terrier too. Big fellow. And how there was a, a family party. And she wasn't paying attention. And the dog was out with the kids in the yard and the, and the rest of the family. And apparently the kids were on little scooters. I don't know if it was motorized or foot pedal. She didn't specify, but you know, you're kind of getting a picture already. Family gathering, kids moving around, maybe in high speeds, making noise. Apparently the dog grabbed her kid. <laughs> when I say grab, he bit her. He grabbed her with his mouth. And that's relevant that I point that little verbiage out. Dog bit the child, and she said, uh, "Mostly grabbed clothes, but it did pinch the skin, but didn't puncture." So I'm thinking, all right, she's going to be getting to the point where she's asking for advice on how to deal with her dog, right? Nope. She wanted advice as how to deal with the discrimination. Use that word. How do you deal with all the discrimination that people will project and subject you and your dog to? Because, of course, the people at the party read her the riot act. They just saw her own kid get bit by her own dog. And they gave her a, a hard time about it. And I'm sure they probably went above and beyond. I'm sure they probably made some ignorant statements relating to, you know, like pit bulls want to eat kids or something. I'm sure they went down that road. But I don't care. The fact is, she's here asking for help as to how to deal with breed discrimination in a situation where her own dog bit her own kid. You know, and I chime in because I was feeling froggy. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure this is about discrimination. What does this have to do with discrimination? Your dog bit your own child and a bunch of people were rightfully and justfully concerned about your dog biting your own child. This has to do with you and your dog and your dog's behavior. This has nothing to do with discrimination. So, of course... I got roasted. I mean, <laughs> the fur mommies were coming out in full force, calling me names, saying the dog didn't bite the child. The dog was protecting the child from all the chaos. That's why it grabbed. I said grabbed with its mouth. What do you call biting? If opening the mouth and closing the mouth onto something isn't biting, what do you call it? 
And then you had other people saying, oh, it was an accident. I mean, the dog accidentally went up to the kid, opened its mouth, put the mouth around the child and closed it. That was all. That's a bunch of accidental steps. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not, it went, it went on from there. And, you know, it's like, I got called a pit bull hater. I got called all this. Like I got two in the house right now that come when called, by the way, um, <laughs> you know, like, and, and all the people coming to the defense of this woman, like, you know, oh, that's so, I'm so sorry you had to deal with discrimination and da, 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 da. I'm like, one lady's like, I think you're in the wrong group, buddy. I'm like, oh, why is truth, personal accountability, responsibility, and caring about dogs unwelcome in this group? Because that's all I'm talking about, you know, and this is not an isolated incident. Right. This is not just one random outlier experience, anecdotal experience that I'm sharing with you guys. Like, no, this happens every single day. These minds, this group has over 50,000 people in it, all owning pit bull type dogs. And it's like, this is why pit bulls are having problems. It isn't because of dog fighters right now. It isn't because of people abusing the animals. No, it's because we have a current culture right now. And the people that are infatuated with these rather intense and very special and unique type of dogs the people that are infatuated with them shouldn't even have a dog in the first place they shouldn't even have a labrador most of them and they have pit bulls um you know case in point in another group i saw this lady post a video of two approximately i'm going to say like maybe six year old five six seven year old children two of them running around screaming in the living room jumping on the couch jumping never mind the behavior of the children we won't go there um Jumping around with probably an eight to 10 month old pit bull, chasing them around the house, highly aroused, tail up high and, and moving quickly. The dog's barking and jumping and the kids are like into the drapes and into the blinds. And, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and the dog's bah, 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 bah. well, the one girl jumps down off the couch. And she runs across the camera. Whoever's holding the cell phone is giggling and thinking, this is just great. And films it. The kid runs over to the table. It's a girl. And she's trying to like kind of get up on the kitchen table. And the dog follows her over. And what does the dog do? Does it grab her? <laughs> it, grab, it grabs the clothing a little bit. Oh, God. And then, the, and then the video stops. And the person's posting about how cute this is. And all these people in the group are commenting, oh, my God, it's so cute. They're so playful. And, you know, I chime in. Because this is, I have to, this is a group I actually moderate in. So I do have a little bit of like responsibility in there. Wow. That was a typical drinks and dogs uh, glitch, huh? Yeah. But we're back and it happens really fast. So anyway, like the dog comes across the room, chases the girl and like it, it, it better. Now, now some people say, oh, well, it bit the, it bit the shirt. Listen, I, it, yeah, but it wasn't trying to bite the shirt. It was biting the thing that was moving and acting all la, 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 squirrely, right? So, you know, I, I, I comment like, hey, guys, like this is actually incredibly dangerous. Nothing that's happening here is funny. Nothing that is happening here is cute. And anybody who has an inkling of an understanding of dog behavior is watching this video and cringing, waiting for the dog to do something bad and people are so clueless i got attacked heavily on that like oh my gosh this is just a dog and kids having fun you must be a great blast at parties number one i am a blast at parties if you get me drinking i'll be the life of the party <laughs> number two that wasn't a party that was going on in that video that was a dog in a high state of arousal with children behaving incredibly inappropriately around that dog. And that is what triggers bites. And case in point, I'm saying, guys, didn't you see the dog bite the girl at the end? And they were like, he didn't bite her. I'm like, what do you call that? Like, they're in such denial and refusing to see what's right in front of them. Now, here's the kicker. The person who posted it actually responded to me. And they said, well, actually, the dog did start to get aggressive in the following months. And we hired a trainer and we have since resolved it. And I'm thinking, I can't pat you on the back, dog owner. Like, yeah, it's cool that they came in and said, hey, the dog actually did start to get more aggressive. Yeah, no, sh no shit. But the fact is, obviously, that dog trainer failed you. 
Because if after you went through training, you still think this video is so cute to post, that means you didn't learn anything. Nope. You, you, you thought this was cute. Meanwhile, I got tons of people like, oh, there's nothing wrong with this. Da, da, da. I'm like, I actually do this for a living. And I work with people who've done it even more than I have. And guess what? When we're talking about terriers, we're talking about high prey drive dogs. A lot of the bites and the maulings aren't coming from angry aggression. They're not coming from a mean dog. They're not coming from a dog going, I hate you. I want to kill you. No, they're coming from a dog who's like, oh, my God, what's going on? Oh, my God, this is so arousing. Ah, you're moving so fast. I can't help it. And what starts out as a little bite turns into a full fledged prey driven attack in a very primitive, primal, genetic way. And it all starts from what this lady was showing in a video. It all starts from how the, the post I was talking about at the beginning of this, you know, little segment here with a dog hyper aroused, kids running around screaming, moving quick, and the dog grabs. That's actually where a lot of these fatalities with children start. It starts with prey driven behavior. It doesn't start with, oh, I'm a mean dog. I hate everybody. Yeah, I mean, and it's the snowball effect, man. Like this is something that happens. Once a dog knows it can do one thing, it does it again, and then it does it again, and it's constantly. I mean, they're the ultimate opportunist. They're always gonna just like, oh hey, let me. I could do that. I could do that. I could do that. And it always comes out of that state of arousal. I mean, look at how we build like working dogs, right? We build working dogs through like honor rag. Okay, oh cool. We build the confidence of buying that. Then we build them on like a tug, and then we build them on a sleeve, and then we build them on a suit, and then we go them from there, like. You know, whatever it is, they progressively learn that they can do these things because we we allow them to do those things. And I tell all my clients all the time, I was like, you're I know you want this dream relationship with your dog where it's like you have your, you know, freaking fluffy that just hangs out with you. And like, you know, you're just kind of like it's part of part of the family and like you live this movie life or whatever it may be. And granted, there are dogs that are like that, like my dog Bear, very like he was one of those like unicorn ish dogs. My dog Marilyn. That was not a unicornish dog. That dog was, it's like you said, very re like reactive. It's like kind of like she just wanted to chase the squirrel. And sometimes the squirrel was a kid. Sometimes the squirrel was a dog. Sometimes the squirrel was a squirrel. You know, like there's certain things. And that was due to a lot of mismanagement that I was having, like just because the former household I was in, a lot of allowances were happening when I wasn't there. So what you allow your dog to do, they're going to do. And it doesn't matter how much you love your dog because, you know, loving your dog is creating a balanced life for your dog. Loving your dog is not just doing what you want to do so you can post stupid videos on social media about how cute your dog is and all these other things. You have to have that. Like you said, Katie, like look in the mirror. You got to look in the mirror and be, re be real with yourself. You got a pit bull terrier. You got a, a, a Malinois. You got whatever these dogs are. And the only thing that we're doing is, you know, we're pacifying ourselves. Like when they say that shit to you, or I say shit, right? Uh, when they say that stuff to you, all they're doing is pacifying themselves. They're making themselves feel better versus looking at the real picture and seeing the problem that's what they're I mean, like, that's how Pitts got on the, you know, uh, freaking on those lists. That's how all that stuff happens by mismanagement, not knowing what you have and being delusional about what you have. Like, that's the thing. And like, you know, one thing that I think that's a, a big problem with social media is that a lot of the times these people post, like, they're delusional with their posts. A lot of it's like, look how cute this dog is. Look how cute my dog is. And so maybe some dogs are pretty chill, but some dogs are not. I mean, most dogs are not. You might get those unicorn dogs. Every once in a while, people see those online. They're like, oh, look at how good this pit bull is or whatever like that. I mean, Larry Hansen, you know who Larry Hansen is? Of course. So like Larry Hansen was on the Elevated podcast, and then she's very well versed in pits. She's been showing dogs. She's done ring with them. She's done a bunch of stuff. A lady I, I really respect. Me too. Uh, and, it, and she was like saying like, you know, she, you know, Oscar asked her like, do you think pits can be pet, or pet dogs? And she said no. And then she's like very bluntly honest with it. And like, I agree with her. Unless you're unless you're somebody who's going to manage the dog properly, give them the adequate amount of exercise, the training, the boundaries. You know, you're teaching. Like my daughter, you know, I, I, everyone knows whoever follows me. And my, I love my daughter's like my everything. And like my daughter knows how to interact with dogs. So you got to teach your kids how to interact with dogs too. Because there's not one single incident where, you know, she's trained. There's, you know, I saw that video of her training that little XL bully like you know she knows how to manage him she knows how to train them she's trained like two of my other dogs with me and she knows how to deal with them and work and know the how to create those boundaries and I think that's something that people won't people want to live in that like 
La La Land or Delusion, where it's not how it's not how uh it's not what is it, what's the one? It's not how you uh it's something about how you train them. It's not the breed. It's like how you train them or something. Oh, like everyone that. says it's all in how you raise them. Yes, all in how you raise them. I mean, then then again, if you want to look at it that way, it's all in how you raise them. It's all in how you raise them. If you don't set boundaries, they're going to do certain things. If you set boundaries, they're going to not do certain things. But understanding that genetics, understanding what they need, what they require is vastly important. And that's how we, that's how you love your dog. That whole, here's an interesting, and I agree 100%, of course. Here's an interesting paradox, if you will. It's really not a paradox. I got to call it something. About the whole, it's all in how you raise that thing. Typically, it's not paradox. It's ir irony. Irony. Here's something really ironic. The people who scream the loudest that it's all in how you raise them, ironically, raise and believe in interactions with dogs that, that create aggression. Because I'm just like, you know, typically when we see the, the, the comment, it's all in how you raise them. You know, the, the, those in the know, we talk about genetics, right? We're like, no, it's not all in how you raise them. Who the dog is genetically plays a factor. However, with that being said, how you raise them is absolutely relevant. It's just that the people who think that's all it is raise them in incredibly dysfunctional, toxic ways. They never want to punish the dog. They never want to set boundaries. They never want to teach the dog what it can and can't do. They think that cuddling is everything. And as any of us who work with dogs know, you will create far more aggression with coddling and cuddling and accommodating. You will create aggressive behavior or you will create a state of mind where aggression is more prone by doing that more than you will by all of the things that they typically think will create aggression. Yep. And that's, that's why we have more aggression. Now we have more aggressive behavior in dogs now than ever before. Yep. But we have all this knowledge now and all this science. No, what we have is a very toxic, weak culture that doesn't believe in accountability. People who can't set personal boundaries in their own space. So they think boundaries are bad. It's like, I can't do this or I suck at this. So it's bad because I can't do it. Let me just say that it's a bad thing that I can't do. It's like, no, actually, you should be able to do that. And the fact that you can is a problem that you should probably try to address. The thing, like the one thing too, is like, this is something like that's always been like, I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the world <laughs> at all remotely. I'm very cavemanish, but Again, we created dogs to be biddable, right? We made we made we could have been biddable. What does biddability mean? Ability to learn, wanting to wanting to please, all these other things. Throughout the years, we've went through positive reinforcement. These people who say they're science based trainers, which no shit. If you if you correct a dog, it's going to create a negative reaction in their mind or in their brain or whatever like that, and they're gonna not want to do it anymore, which is gonna create some form of fear. Duh, that's life. That's what we do. That's how we stop. That's how we stop people from doing bad things. This is how we stop dogs from doing bad things. It's part of life. That's like an obvious pro, like con, but like we create them to be biddable. So now we're de we're developing a, a breeds of dogs. And I see this all the time who don't want to be biddable whatsoever because they've gone through that process of just like letting dogs just be whatever, like you know, do whatever they're doing, cuddling, all these other things. We're forgetting we're forgetting the process of how we had dogs, which is why we're having so many problems problems with aggression. I mean, even if you look at like dog parks, proper socialization for dogs is creating neutrality around dogs. That's how you create. Like, if you watch that post that I, I put on, like the canine you posted on it, and like it makes me cringe every single time when I talk about dog parks. Like I got blown up on that thing. And I was like, for me, I was like, obviously like, I'm the type of person like, okay, I remember you. I remember you. I remember you. <laughs> <if> I, <laughs> and if I see you, like there's going to be a problem. I got enough money for lawyers, so it's all good. Uh, we're, so it's like, you know, it's it's one of those things that we're drifted so far away from the reality of what dogs are. And people who say it's science-based, like, obviously, there's certain things that happen in the brain 
if you give them a treat, dopamine releases, whatever. If you give them, you make them, you correct them, their brain's going to go in like, you know, fear or whatever it may be. Like, duh, that's part of life. Everything is balanced in life. And when it comes to that, if you mess up at your job, you're going to get fired. That's going to suck, right? If you talk shit to the wrong person, they're going to punch you in the face. That's going to hurt, right? But what it does is it creates a specific understanding of what how you can act in life and how you should act in life. So that's the most important thing. And what we're doing with these dogs, oh, great. granted, these people love their animals, which is great. Love your animals, but love your animals in the way that they need to be loved. Love them by creating balance. Love them by understanding proper social neutrality. I'm not telling you to beat your dog. I'm not telling you to, you know, be abusive and like not love your dog. Cuddle your dog if you want to cuddle your dog, but also make sure you have specific boundaries and understanding like what you can and can't do, what they can and can't do. Because that's the most important part of it. Like if you don't understand those values in the dog and understand what you have, like you're just setting yourself up for a disaster. And like you said, like you can get your kid bit, like you can get your fam family members bit, you can get hurt people. And then, you know, state of California, if you get, your, if someone, if your dog bites somebody and, and like hurts them, like, you can jeopardize your own life. Like you can get sued for a ton of money, like tons of money. So understanding that is a, I think that's something that most people don't really get. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to catch some heat for this one, but, but whatever. Well, <laughs> well, in the spirit of catching heat, how I'll take it a step further. You know, I, I believe that there are a lot of dog owners who don't actually love their dogs. Um, I believe in the concept of the fake dog lover, and I've hashtagged it numerous times, fake dog lovers. A fake dog lover. What is a fake dog lover? It's a person who loves how having a dog makes them feel more than they love the dog itself. I'll say that again. They're in love with, or they are emotionally attached to how certain aspects of owning a dog, including how the dog makes them feel more than they are in love with or emotionally attached to the individual entity that is the dog itself. Evidence of this is when, we'll go right to the easy one, canine obesity. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. He's like, oh, the KD is <laughs> pushing all the shiny red buttons today. Hello, algorithm. Hello, engagement. I don't care how we get it. We're going to get it by telling the truth. So we have a uh, insane epidemic, pandemic, whatever you want to call it. I think epidemic of canine obesity in the Western world, particularly in the United States. And when you have someone who posts a picture or someone who has a morbidly obese dog, and I don't care how much sugar you coat it in. If you say anything that indicates that they should change the way they feed the dog, I don't care how you say it. If they react defensively, aggressively, or with any type of hostility, they are a fake dog lover. Because what you're doing is you're not challenging the dog. You're not criticizing the dog. They'll accuse you of criticizing the dog. But, like, oh, you're fat shaming the dog. Hey, you can't fat shame a dog. You can <laughs> you can shame the owner of a fat dog for overfeeding the dog and not caring for them. But you can't actually shame the dog. It doesn't work that way. If they react defensively or aggressively, you have to ask yourself, what are they reacting to? They're reacting to you challenging an action or a behavior that they as the human, as the dog owner are doing, they are more attached to the way they treat the dog, which in this case might be overfeeding it. They get something out of that. Yep. They get a nurturing feel. There's a number, we're not going to get into the nuances of that psychology, but they're actually invested and attached to their own interaction with the dog. So when you bring up the fact that the dog is morbidly obese, the dog is at a significant risk for health issues, pain and suffering, and here's the icing on the cake, dying sooner than it should die. Dogs already have a brutally short lifespan. Why are you shortening it? You're telling them that you can help add years to their dog's life. You're telling them you can help them make their dog actually be less pain, in, in less pain, and they attack you. 
because yep. they don't actually love the dog. They love the way they interact with the dog. They love the way the dog makes them feel. And now with social media, people use dogs to virtue signal moral superiority. So every time you see that selfie, they post it in a group of 100,000 other dysfunctional people. They post a picture of their overweight dog that is going to die sooner than it should. And everyone goes, oh, my gosh, he's so fluffy. He's so cute. You must love your dog so much. <laughs> Meanwhile, that dog owner is getting high on the social validation of people who they don't even know, which is a whole separate level of dysfunction and toxicity. They don't love the dog. They love how yeah. having that dog makes them feel. They love how they can use that dog as a tool to get validation from complete strangers. And so when we, no matter how nicely we put it, when we challenge anything they're doing with the dog, even though what our suggestion might be could help the dog, when they attack you, you know they're a fake dog lover. They love something else more than they love the dog. Absolutely. And the thing is, I've always said, it's like people treat, like the reason why a lot of positive reinforcement people and like people who do the feeding thing is because ideally, like in their head, like you said, it's for them, right? So people treat the dog the way that they feel they want to be treated. Like they, that's kind of like the thing. It's like, you know, people always like, it's that idealistic thought process of like, oh, I just want like everything positive, everything positive. Cause that's because you want everything positive. You don't want a hard life. You don't want to deal with the toughness that comes with life. So you're projecting that onto your dog and being like freaking feeding the dog, whatever the hell it wants, you know, just kind of doing whatever it is, because that's just a projection of what you, I feel that your, your life should be like. And how does that work out every single time? Yep. Always bad. <laughs> it's like vegan dog food. Oh, oh, <laughs> dude, that's a, that one. We'll, like, have to, we'll have to save that one for later. <laughs> oh, vegan dog food. Yeah. All right, Katie, Katie you want to give the, the sponsors a shout out? For those watching the video, I'm rocking the Ray Allen manufacturing shirt that I got at trial number three, courtesy of Ray Allen. Love that company. Not just because I got a cool shirt from them, but USA, made in. Call that company up for customer service. You're getting people that are there. You're getting people that were probably sewing stuff. You're getting people that are there under that roof, making stuff for you, customizing it, making it up to the standards that not just the military and police require, but that every dog owner should require. And for those that think I'm reading that, I'm not. That's the truth. And I'm saying it off the top of my head. That's how we do sponsor shout outs here. Ray Allen Manufacturing. What's the code? People can, if they use a code, so, they get a discount courtesy of Primal. Yep. So use rayallen.com forward slash K9SL. Primal 10 is the code. All caps. Primal 10. Use all that. Pet owners. It's for everything. Police, K9, military. It doesn't matter. You it's got a dog. Literally, it's like, I mean, it's literally the one-stop shop for all your dog training needs, really. Oh, I that reminds me. I actually need to hit up good old Matt Wilson and the folks over there. I want to get a one of those. They have those really nice collars that have the the e-collar well, goes elusive. into it. Yeah. But it's, a, it's like a really good collar. It just, you can slide. I got to get one of those. Uh, no, they're awesome. I mean, we uh, they they re they redid it too. So it used to like come through the actual like through the collar, like so like the contact points would go through the collar, and then the strap would go over the top of it. So now it's actually underneath the collar, and the straps are like right there. So you get more contact points, and you don't have to have it as tight. So it's. I'm really, glad I waited. Yeah, no, this the new one is really really good. Do they sell the wings too? Do you know what I'm talking about the wings? They. I don't know. You'd have to ask Wilson about that. They, I'm sure they do. I mean, they. I know they sell a lot of e-collar stuff there, so they might have the attachments. Do you use wings? Yeah, I use them for some uh, some dogs. And for I those, used... uh, I feel bad. Like, okay, so those watching, when I talk about wings, I found out about wings hmm, it, probably not too long ago. <laughs> shamefully, um, a wing. We call. I call them wings. I think that's what they're called. Yeah. It's where you can replace. So on an e-collar, you got your two nodes. The stint where the stimulation passes through, you can take those off and you can replace them with much more, two little flexible, yeah, like just like 
that. Yeah, and they move like they're flexible. So when you have a dog with, you know, a, a, a double coat, it gets in that coat and it maintains contact without having to put the collar on too tight. You get, I found I got much more consistent communication using the wings. However, Absolutely. I did notice different, I've gotten di wings from different companies and some of them oxidized. That's why I, I like the e collar technology ones. The e collar technology ones have been by far the most like durable ones and more more consistent uh, consistent ones as well so that's the ones that i've been using i've been using a lot of those like just on certain dogs because i do notice that because i've even used it on dogs who are a little more stubborn like just a little more like you have like i don't because i don't really like cranking it up for a dog i kind of just like i want to use the lowest stimulus i possibly can for it so i've even used that on like certain dogs who have like a thinner coat and then that way like it kind of because it creates that contact because of the the flexibleness and like just the hooks and goes into it so I've even used it on like some like thinner coat dogs and I've gotten like great responses for it. So I use the e collar technology ones. They have a variety of different like the thing they have like a uh, what's it what's what's the gold color? Uh what's uh the iridium? I don't I know what you're talking about. I don't know the name of it. They have different they have different metal coated different surfaces. Yeah. Because a couple of times I've got them, I don't know if it was just reaction to the skin, the oils in the coat, but it got it oxidized. It got like rusty. It got weird. Yeah. And, um, you know, I know some dogs do have different uh, allergies to different metals that are used. And they a lot of companies make a variety of different types of metal coatings to alleviate any potential um, skin issues with that. Definitely. Well, shoot, brother. It's time to wrap it up. Next wrap episode. Up. Next yeah. episode, vegan dog food. <laughs> I'll come prepared. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have alcohol for that one forget the caffeine <laughs> we'll have a good one so episode 31 all wrapped up thank you my brother for taking the time thank you everyone thank you for watching this make sure you like comment share with your friends again we do this for free so if you can just go ahead and share with your friends just click the link button share the link button and send them on so again stay tuned for the next one Bye.